This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Gilan Halpern. Every week we bring you conversations with authors about the books and research and other things that we like. And if you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash review. Scroll down to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon. Click and support us. Some of you have been doing this for months and years and we simply cannot thank you enough. This episode is produced in partnership with the Jacob Robinson Institute for the History of Individual and Collective Rights at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. My guest today is an associate researcher at the Robinson Institute and an associate professor in law at the University of Roehampton in the UK. His book, Jews, Sovereignty and International Law, Ideology and Ambivalence in Early Israeli Legal Diplomacy, was published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Dr. Rotem Giladi, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Thank you, Gilal. Pleasure being here. So the book focuses on the intersection between two historical forces, the evolution of international law and the evolution of Jewish sovereignty, both in the immediate wake of great upheavals. International law had undergone com- a complete overhaul, after the Second World War, as the Jewish sovereignty with the establishment of the State of Israel. So let's discuss them one by one before we get to the intersection and start with international law. What did it come to stand for in the latter half of the 1940s? So the common conception in research is and has been for quite a while that uh, international law reforms in the post-war era after 1945 placed the individual and protection of the individual and protection and the welfare of the individual at the center of international law's concern as opposed to state concerns, state interests prior to the World War. And according to this uh, uh, argument or, or this understanding of the history of international law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, the uh, Genocide Convention of the same year, the Refugee Convention of 1951, etc., um, were or represented a moral humanist uh, response by the international community to the Second World War and to the horrors of the Holocaust in particular. Mm-hmm. So that's the uh, that's that side, the global uh, order, uh, reform of the global order side of things. Okay, and, and when we get to what you call the sovereign turn when it comes to yeah. Israeli legal diplomacy, what was, this, uh, what was the relationship between uh, the um, legal diplomats on the Jewish Zionist side and international law before 1940? So this really goes to the core of the ambition of the book, right? Uh, we see from the very end of the 19th century, uh, Jews engaging with the international law, right? Uh, Jews uh, studying law uh, because the universities open up, uh, starting uh, studying uh, and researching and developing academic careers in international law. And the question, how, the question is, how do we think of them? Why do they turn to international law? And the answer I'd like to provide, uh, the answer I do provide in the book, is that we can understand this process in sociological terms, absolutely. We have to uh, gauge it in terms of uh, emancipation in Western Europe and Central Europe. But we can also think about it ideologically. So, so the, the sociological explanation is meaning that Jews have become more emancipated, more integrated in the broader society, and therefore we're looking for greater positions of power and international law was... That's one, one way of one, describing mm-hmm. it, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Social mobility, uh, uh, internalizing the uh, um, various aspects of modernity, right? Because mm-hmm. law is a, is a social mobility instrument, a career in law in particular. Yeah. And again, universities uh, opened up to uh, Jews, public uh, service positions, including in some countries, these are academic positions, like in Germany, right? Mm-hmm. Professors are civil servants, open to Jews. And so we see... Uh, I don't want to say dominated, but we see a presence of uh, Jews in the international legal okay. profession from the turn of the century onwards. Okay, and the ideological explanation that we're going to... The ideological mention? explanation is that um, uh, Jews turn to international law for all sorts of reasons, but, but we can identify, uh, I think, more or less three main ideological engagements that bring Jews to international law um, 
and that Jews who turn to international law seek to promote. So one is the vision of emancipation, Western-style emancipation, uh, becoming equal citizens of France, the United Kingdom, Germany, and so on and so forth. And this is a project, and there are institutions in Western, Jewish institutions in Western Europe that are invested in uh, civic equality, in political equality. And by the mid-40s, the, by the beginning of the 1940s, this is a project, this is the human rights project, basically. Jews and Jewish institutions invested in human rights uh, in order to... Uh, make sure that the fruits of uh, emancipation are available. But I, w- I want to spend a bit more time on this, because you said that after the Second World War, the whole concept of human rights evolves and focuses more on the individual. What was it before, when they were starting off? So before that, uh, if you look at the late 19th century, early 20th century, there is uh, a movement towards uh, demands for religious equality, religious freedom, civic uh, civic equality, and so on and so forth. But the project is being internationalized, some would say from the 1920s onwards, some would say from the early 40s onwards. Uh, and after the, four, this is the Second World War, this is really uh, converges into the human rights uh, project in which quite a lot of Jewish institutions are invested in, the American Jewish Committee, for example. So these are simulationist projects in a sense, right? The uh, international engagement of such individuals, such as Hirsch Lauterpacht in Cambridge, Uh, and the American Jewish Committee that I uh, mentioned earlier is to uh, basically to find in international law a platform, a project of emancipation and equality. Mm -hmm. So that's one uh, ideology, right? Another reason uh, or another ideological imperative uh, that drives some Jews to international law is Zionism. Uh, one form and only one form of Jewish national um, ideology, right? National liberation ideology. And here we have to go back to Pinsker and Herzl and identify, and that's what I try to do in the book, identify the international legal thought underpinning uh, the commitment. And here, very simply, we can say in the Basel, we can see in the Basel program, uh, a rather ambiguous, for tactical reasons, allusion to the support, the recognition of international law for the national home, right, for the homeland. Uh, so Jews uh, who count themselves as Zionists look at international law and try to promote the national project, the ter- national territorial project. The third ideology, uh, unless you want to ask question, f- further questions on that, is a response to territorial uh, nationalism, is a response to Zionism. And I think it's encapsulated in the writings of uh, Simon Dubnov, a uh, Jewish historian of prominence, who at first rejects uh, territorial Zionism, who advances a vision of an advanced type of uh, nationalism and Jewish nationalism in the diaspora. And after the First World War, this captures or this is manifest in an agenda of minority rights and autonomism. So that's another national ideology. It shares a lot with Zionism, a lot of the common assumptions and and, and readings of anti-Semitism and so on and so forth. But the international law project there is minority rights and autonomy within the state, Eastern Europe, for example, after the First World War, rather than a territorial base. And what sort of resonance did all these ideologies find in the broader international law community, whether institutions or academia or... So, of course, this is, uh, these are Jewish projects in a sense, but they have resonance in Eastern Europe in the establishment of new states with uh, new minorities uh, as part of the Versailles order. So, uh, in Lithuania, for example, Jews and other minorities can advance claims against the Lithuanian state and at the same time offer, at least in the very beginning, some things in return uh, to the new uh, Lithuanian state uh, international recognition. For example, if you uh, treat your minorities properly, if you uh, make promises and undertake certain obligations towards your minorities, there's a greater chance that the League of Nations, that you will be admitted to the League of Nations, that uh, the international community will accord some recognition to your territorial and other claims against Poland or whoever it is. So there is certainly resonance there. 
the human rights movement uh, in the 40s certainly serves other agenda. Of course, that Jews can uh, collaborate with uh, other forces uh, or sell to the Amer- to, to the U.S. administration or whatever it is. So mm. yeah, these are not these are Jewish projects, but they're not isolated from a general context, yeah. of course. And and of course, we know how the story ends with the rise of Nazism and the Second World War and the Holocaust. Can you uh, um, identify the shift at a certain point, or is it really? Uh, Uh, right after the the war that international law comes out of the ashes and reinvents itself it's a complicated question because uh, you can apply it to uh, several of the phenomena that we have been discussing so far i think what is important to highlight is that up until well up until the late 40s and maybe a little bit further international law is a field of contestation between these ideological uh, movements within the jewish world right it is a field of contestation and most of the international lawyers or people who do international law research scholarship advocacy uh, can belong to one or more of these camps uh And you start seeing a shift uh, in the late 30s, in the early 40s, people change their position. Uh, Jews with international engagements, serious, considerable international engagements, uh, because of the pressures of Europe, in Europe, because of the pressures in Palestine as well, uh, change their position. Not everybody in the same direction, but some people like Jacob Robinson, who was an avid supporter of uh, autonomy, uh, as an expert in uh, minority rights, close collaborators of Simon Dubnov, that I mentioned, who I mentioned earlier, starts uh, having doubts, starts having second thoughts, starts transforming uh, towards territorial nationalism, towards Zionism, culminating in his 1947 recruitment by uh, Moshe Sharet, at the time the head of the political department of the Jewish Agency for Palestine, to come work for the Jewish Agency's mission to the United Nations, working on partition, right? Mm -hmm. So people change their positions, and this is really uh, a defining feature of the 1940s. Yeah, and and also the defining feature not just of the people themselves and the jurists, whoever it was, but really of the situation as a whole, because Jewish sovereignty after 1948, or even slightly before, came to mean just one thing. The same way, perhaps, that, you know, socialism in 1918 uh, was embodied in the Soviet Union, so uh, Jewish collective rights after 1948 were embodied in the State of Israel, and a state, a functioning state, means something completely different also you know institutionally but also in you know in in in, in, in every possible respect we certainly see shifts in what zionism means throughout the ages so if we start with uh, the basel congress and uh, dubnov's uh, response to the basel con- uh, congress and to herzl uh We see over the years uh, Dubnov uh, mitigating some of his criticism of the messianism of the Zionist movement. Uh, in 19, uh, 1905, 1906, uh, terito- sorry, territorialist Zionists and autonomists uh, work up out some sort of a formula of synthesis uh, in, in Helsinki, Helsingfors uh, formula, Uh, and suddenly everybody is a Zionist, right? And everybody is investing in diaspora work instead of the negation of the diaspora, which is the original uh, imperative of Zionism. Uh, so for a long time, for several decades, uh, people like Jacob Robinson, again, mm-hmm. <laughs> can describe themselves as Zionists, and uh, I can't say that in English, let's call it a shekel, make the contribution, mm-hmm. right, to the Zionist movement, the, the monetary contribution, become members, even though they are a, engaged with exclusively diaspora concerns, and this changes. These yeah. changes in the 30s and in the 40s again. And, and, and also in terms of uh, policy making, because right now you have a sovereign government of a sovereign state and everything sort of, you know, it becomes a receptacle of all this, uh, uh, both ideology and also policy. So what happens in uh, 1948 or 1949, uh, have a little bit of, a, I'm complicating the timeline a bit, uh, but what happens with the advent of uh, Jewish sovereignty is that Zionism uh, contracts. 
what it means to be Zionist contracts even further. So there are all sorts of ideological sensibilities that were there all along, but sometimes were uh, muted or were submerged or became the object of uh, compromise, uh, ideological or practical. We can debate about that. Uh, but suddenly there is a hegemonic, uh, ideological creed of what it means to be a Zionist. Absolutely. And this is precisely the creed that uh, the two protagonists of my book, uh, Shabtai Rosen, who was the first legal advisor of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, Jacob Robinson, who is now the legal advisor for, the, for Israel's uh, UN mission in New York, this is exactly the creed that they are trying to give effect to. They try to define, to interpret what does it mean to be a new Jew, a sovereign Jew. And that's how they approach international law. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, why, why the, the two protagonists? Why Shabtai Rosen, the uh, first legal advisor of the Israeli foreign ministry, as you say, and Jacob Robinson has come up several times in, in the discussion so far, and as you said, the legal advisor to Israel's inaugural UN mission. Why, why, why did you choose to focus on them? Oh, that's a very good question, uh, because they're there, because they're the ones, they're the archi architects of Israel's legal uh, position or outlook uh, on international law in the world in the first decade. So simply by reason of uh, who they are, where they are at the right time, in the right place and all that. But also because of personal interest, of course, Robinson is a very fascinating uh, uh, figure. He is a key to understanding more than Jewish engagements with international law. Uh, and I encountered him, uh, or I found out about him rather late in my career as, an, as a historian of international law. Uh, Shabtai Rosen, who died in, in, in 2010, I actually met when I uh, started working for the Legal Advisors Office of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is quite, as opposed to Robinson, is quite widely known in uh, international law circles. Well, very well known. Uh, so there was a little bit of a personal interest there as well. Mm -hmm. But these two are the key to Israel's legal uh, perspective. You said that Robinson, well, Robinson, of course, was a generation above uh, Rosen, much older than him and much more experienced. And you said earlier that he had undergone some uh, um, ideological shifts in response to the way uh, uh, you know, history uh, unfolded. Uh, what about Rosen? Did he also? Uh, um, what, what was the sort of a, a evolution of his legal and political outlook? That's a fascinating question. So he's uh, 28 years uh, junior. He was born in 1917, another uh, key year for Zionist history, of course. Uh, and he was born in London uh, to a well-off family who is pioneering in the film industry. And there's a whole story there, but the Lumiere brothers are involved in all that, but we won't go into that at the moment. Uh, and he is born to a family that we would describe most likely as an assimilationist fam a family, uh, Jewish uh, consciousness, if, if you will, but certainly not Zionist. Uh, and according to uh, his sister, he uh, found uh, Zionism all on his own uh, at a rather young age, at 16, uh, he becomes a Zionist. He also becomes involved uh, at first with some of the assimilationist institutions of British Jewry, such as the Anglo-Jewish uh, Association. Um, fast forward, uh, so he's involved in all sorts of uh, Zionist activities and, and newspapers and everything. Uh, 1939, First World War, uh, he becomes a lawyer for the Royal Air Force, uh, travels the world, so to speak, visits Palestine, does all sorts of things. But one of the things he starts doing around 1943 is to look again at Simon Dubnov's writing. And he starts writing a series of articles uh, for the Zionist press in London in English, uh, in which he tries to find meaning for the diaspora according to Simon Dubnov's teachings. And he starts writing a book. And at some stage, he abandons the manuscript and he abandons the attempt to find uh, a meaning to the diaspora because he realized that the diaspora, as it existed before the Second World War, is not going to exist anymore. 
So now his loyalty is switched exclusively to the Palestinian project. And uh, the day that he is demobilized, he goes to 77 uh, uh, Great Russell Square to the Jewish Agency's office, starts working there. And by the end of 1947, he immigrates to Palestine with his family uh, to work for the political department of the Jewish Agency. So, so he has his own transformation, even though it's... Uh, uh, not as tortured, I would say, as Robinson, because Rob for Robinson has invested two decades of his life, as he admits himself, in minority rights and in the autonomy project, and he has to come to terms with that, and it's not easy. Yeah. Okay, so how do they, the, the two, perceive their uh, the mission after 1948? As you said in the beginning of this conversation, international law is now more, much more focused on the individual, but... Jewish uh, um, politics had gone in the other direction, right? Right now, there's, there's this single collectivity that can speak for uh, and on behalf of the Jews. How, how, how did, uh, do these two forces being recon reconciled? So this is where I'll take, uh, I'll put on my uh, critical historian hat and I will say that uh, the common conception is that international after 1945 is more focused on the individual. I do have some doubts and I'm not alone in that. But there's certainly a trend to speak the language of individual rights, to uh, speak the welfare of the individual. But this is exactly the point where our two uh, protagonists are invested in collective project. So I would say that first and foremost for them, on their agenda, on the, their perspective, the mission is establishment of the Jewish state, uh, its uh, recognition, legitimacy, UN admission, everything that has to do with the conflict. Uh, the Israeli Arab conflict, no doubt about that. That's the foremost item on their agenda. But they also deal with the matters of Jewish concerns. And they define these as marginal items, not my words, their words, but at the same time, they invest inordinate amounts of time and energy and resources in these, and in different ways that we can really and we should really expand on. My main claim in the book is that they're ambivalent about international law. Uh, the lawyers, the international lawyers, are ambivalent international, uh, about international law precisely because of its uh, uh, impact uh, on Jewish affairs. How so? How so? <laughs> how so? <laughs> All right. Uh, per perhaps with an, let me give you an example. So, 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 so the book basically looks at three case studies, right? The... Uh, an aspect of uh, the human rights revolution, the rights of individuals to bring petitions to international organizations that's linked to the human rights covenant that uh, the UN starts working on after, the, uh, after 1948. The second project is the Genocide Convention of 1948, the second case study, and the third case study is the 1951 Refugee Convention. Let me give you an example about the uh, Genocide Convention, and not by our two protagonists, but, but rather by Israel's uh, foreign min eh, sorry, uh, Justice Minister uh, Felix or Pinchas uh, Rose, Rosen, a liberal German Jew who presents the Genocide Convention to the Knesset. There's no relationship. No relationship. Yep. Uh, spelled different in English, yep. too. Mm -hmm. Rosenblatt, Rosen is Roson, used to be Rosenbaum, mm -hmm. different uh, locations as well, Russia as opposed to Germany mm -hmm. and all that. So, uh, Felix Rosen presents the Genocide Convention to the Knesset in 1949 in the following terms. First, he says that Israel was particularly interested in the convention, and I quote, as a first general instrument for the protection of national, religious, and racial minorities, which already brings Simon Dubnov into the conversation, mm -hmm. of course. He then says the Jewish people has a vital interest in the convention for obvious reasons, right? This is 1949. And then he proceeds to say, the decisive practical power of the convention may be doubted. That's one. Number two, he says the convention has no power to return our victims to us. Number three, and that's, I think, most crucial, he says that this convention presents no solution to all dispersed people in the diaspora. The radical solution is known to us. It was that radical solution what had brought us to a state, and it was what had allowed us to take part in the ratification of the treaty. In other words, Jewish sovereignty or the establishment of the Jewish state, not international law, is the path for Jewish emancipation. 
And very, in, in very similar terms, we see Rosen and Robinson approaching international law with such ambivalence. They look at international law not in order to ask uh, so much um, how does it affect Jewish interests or even how does it affect Israeli interests. Rather, they ask the question, what does the Zionist grid tell us about this convention? And they found it, they taste international law uh, against the uh, criteria or the standard of the Zionist creed, of the Zionist ideology in its now a more radical form after 1948. And they tend... Radical form being everything is concentrated on the Yes, as we discussed, as we discussed, yes. Uh, And they tend to find, more often than not, international law lacking. The problem with the Genocide Convention, for example, there were several problems with the Genocide Convention. So it has no power to protect Jews, because only the Jewish state can do that, right? And this resonates with today, perhaps, but we'll come back to that later on, Mm -hmm. I I suspect. (laughs) We've got good instincts. (laughs) Yes. Uh, And the problem is, of course, uh, besides that, the the convention uh, represents a continuation of minority politics, of autonomism, of Dubnovism, if you'd like. Yeah, but it's not really a question of, you know, just philosophical ambivalence. You know, looking at it in 1948... International law, if I were, um, I don't know, a legal scholar or just a lay observer in 1948, I would say international law is com- completely irrelevant to us. First of all, it had let us down so miserably over the last few decades. Now we've come out of the ashes, created this mechanism to protect us without having to account for anything else other than our own sovereignty. So why bother? So, yes, absolutely. There were such uh, trends or there were, there were such perspectives uh, after 1945, but this is the, the, the place where I'd like to complicate the picture. Uh, ambivalence is not a matter of uh, uh, time, place, and circumstances, or not just a matter of time, place, and circumstances. Ambivalence inheres in the Zionist ideology, ambivalence towards international law. Because let us not forget, Herzl, before he became a playwright, because before he came, he became Herzl, right? Was a law student at the University of Vienna. There is this chapter in his biography that we are less familiar with. Mm-hmm. And international law is very present in his writings, in his speeches, in the Judenstaat, in the Jewish state, and, and, and his other writings. Uh And I think it's ambivalent about international law because international law at the end of the 19th century, especially at Vienna, uh, takes the position that international law is something for states alone. Only states, and this is a key technical term, are subjects of international law. Only states have rights and obligations and the capacity to entreat under international law. Other, Other entities, including individuals, are mere objects. But that had become dated by 1948. Not what, quite. No? Not quite. And it's not quite dated today. There are exceptions, mm. absolutely, certainly after 1945. I'm not sure that was the real position back in 1897 either, but that was the uh, the theory, the ruling theory of the day, and it's right. qu- still quite, quite dominant mm-hmm. uh, in many ways with some exceptions. So, on the one hand, international presents uh, to Zionists a path for emancipation, right? Get a state, and you shall be equal collectively, right? But at the same time, international place is an obstacle because you're not a state and you cannot entreat. And part of Herzl's uh, intellectual acrobatics is to come up with a way for the Jewish people to become represented, to have a voice, to be in a capacity to entreat with the rules, with the rulers of the world, with the great powers, for example. And we see this ambivalence about the exclusion of Jews, right? The path to emancipation presented by international law, but at the same time to obstacle, the obstacle of getting there. We see that uh, in 
all major Zionist thinkers. We see that in Ben-Gurion's speeches. We see that in Shabtai Rosen's 1947 writing and so on and so forth. Yeah, but, but wasn't 1948 as a concept, because we're talking about 1947 uh, with, with the Patricia Plan, and then 1949 with the admission of Israel as a, as, a, as, a, as a member of the UN, wasn't that a watershed moment in the sense that all this is not theoretical anymore? Israel is now an internationally recognized state, a member of the United Nations and other uh, international instances. What does it mean in practice? It means that these sensibilities still exist, especially in the first decade, right? They're still close to the surface. They're still raw about it in a sense, right? They still have the, the sensibilities. Well, they actually so, think that things could be rolled back? Not necessarily, uh, but this is their... Uh, worldview, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, well, you never the, know. <laughs> yeah, no, this, yeah. the, this is the worldview. This yeah. is, these are the ideological sensibilities. So if ambivalence was uh, inherent in Zionism, there comes the political experience of the Zionist movement with the mandate for Palestine, for example, and uh, Britain reneging of its promise according to certain conceptions and all that. Then comes the Second World War, then, well, before that comes the failure of the minority system, the failure of the League of Nations to uh, prevent world war. Everything that happens between 1939 and 1945 uh, and the war, Israel's war of independence as well. So there is this disenchantment with international law that feeds into this ambivalence. So our protagonists, like many others, um, are invested in international law, but at the same time, they have a baggage. <laughs> how, how did they influence uh, the um, Israel's tradition of, you know, the attitude towards international law later? I mean, to what extent were they, did they pave the way for, you know, later generations of uh, legal advisors in the, in the government and Zionist institutions? Well, Robinson himself died in 1957, so he wasn't around. No, for... no, he retired in 57. He retired. He died in 77. He became a Holocaust uh, scholar, uh, Oh, okay. Well, but, but yeah, he retired. In he, he retired pretty early. Rosen uh, kept as a much younger man, kept on for for much longer. To what extent were they really instrumental in shaping uh, Israel's uh, legal tradition? Uh, they invented it. <laughs> as simple as that. Uh, Robinson did come back. Uh, he continued to advise from the outside, and he did come back for the Eichmann trial, famously. And that's where he had his row with, uh, well, one of his rows with Hannah Arendt. But that's a different story. Uh, Rosen uh, stayed around uh, whenever he came. Uh, I told you earlier that I uh, did a stint at the at the uh, legal advisor's office in the foreign ministry. He was the dean, the doyen, right? Uh, he the el the tribe elder. So what, to was speak. it still involved? Yeah, he was still very much uh, still involved. He did his own things, uh, not necessarily always uh, coordinated with the uh, uh, foreign office, but yeah, he was still involved in many respects. Uh, he was involved in the Turkle Commission, if you remember, uh, the flotilla to Gaza. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, so he set up the commission. Yes, uh, yes, yes. He only died uh, in, in yeah. 2010. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. No, but, but it also, well, clearly, not just international law, not just the state of Israel has changed, but really the legal status of Israel has changed, changed considerably over the years. Absolutely. And so w w to what extent was... Israel's adaptation to the changing, to its changing legal standing, uh, was influenced by uh, Rosen's. Uh, uh, well, I don't know if teaching is the word, but uh, um, spirit. Well, no, I think they were bo both extremely influ influential in, in the sense that they laid the foundation. It's not always easy to uh, perhaps uh, identify the influence in what is in, in contemporary practice uh, because. Um, things became submerged over time. Uh, so these two uh, wrote to each other almost every day, uh, and they did debate ideology, which is quite exceptional, right? In official correspondence within, uh, you know, uh, members of staff at, of the foreign in, uh, of the foreign ministry. But at the same time, out of these exchanges, they formulated positions and states of minds and moods of arguments that are still with us today, that are still identifiable today. Such so, as? 
Let, let's take you know the, the the occupation of the Palestinian territory. No, let's take a, yeah. a different example. Okay. I don't mind discussing the occupation, yeah, okay. but that's not a, that's perhaps not a, a prime example mm-hmm. because uh, by fifty seven uh, Robinson retires, yeah. and in nineteen sixty seven uh, Rosen leaves this particular office. No, but but I, I'm particularly interested okay. in in the way they influenced uh, without the actual presence. I mean, to no, what no, extent let, that let they me, projected on. Let me give you yeah. an example. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, at some stage, Moshe Sharet, the foreign minister, uh, asked Robinson to serve as legal advisor to the Israeli delegation to the uh, talks with Germany, with West Germany, over reparations, right? And there is an effort uh, being made to formulate a basis for Israel's claim from West Germany. And Robinson comes up with this basis. There is a formula that says that Israel uh, uh, absorbed a lot of the victims of the Holocaust, and this is part of the reason why West Germany should compensate Israel. Because Israel basically is the inheritor of uh, Holocaust victims. The very same logic we can see uh, a few years ago in the court ruling, in the Israeli court ruling on the Kafka Literary Estate or the uh, Viennese Community Archives. So positions, uh, policies, interpretations, readings, uh, legal historical, legal cultural are still with us. That is just one example. Of course, there are many others. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, uh, I'm sorry to push you on the uh, please, uh, please do. On, on the occupation because it is yeah. really Israel. It's not the elephant in the room because everyone's talking about it, yeah. but uh, it really is one of Israel's major concerns when it comes to international mm. law. Where do you see, uh, if at all, uh, Jake, uh, Robinson's and Rosen's footprints in Israel's treatment of the of the occupation issue? So that's the thing. They didn't deal with the occupation as legal advisors because, again, uh, Robinson retired a whole decade before that and and, and Rosen just just before. Uh, But I think that Israel's uh, continued ambivalence to international law, including when it comes to the laws of war, which is my my main field of study, actually, history of the laws of war, what we call it today international humanitarian law, rightly or not so rightly. Basically, what... Rosen and Robinson do uh, at some stage is to start appropriating Jewish voices. And what I mean by that, um, pre-1948 and certainly post-1948, Jewish contributions to international law that are not Zionist, that Rosen and Robinson at the time are uh, averse to or opposed to, at later stages, they manage to, or, or they produce interpretations that say, look at what Raphael Lemkin, the father of the Genocide Convention, did. This is a Jewish effort. The Jewish state supported the, gen- the Genocide Convention all along, which is not true. Which the, uh, I mean, the, the, the historical record in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Affairs Files clarifies without doubt that they did not support the, gen- the Genocide Convention, as, as they said later. And uh, the outcome or the output, so the fruit of this appropriation, which we still see today, we still see when there were discussion about the Rome Statute and there was the debate about uh, uh, the uh, settlement clause, whether settlements uh, constitute a war crime or not. And without getting into this debate, part of the official and unofficial response in Israel was the International Criminal Court has been a Jewish project all along, right? So how come we can be uh, made the object or the target of uh, such institutions, of such norms? Uh, this is blaming the victims. Is this uh, uh, argument still being made now with uh, at the International Court of uh, Justice? Not necessarily as, 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 as legal pleadings, but it's certainly part of the uh, state of mind and part of the public discourse in Israel. Yes, you can you can hear it. No question about mm-hmm. that. And. That might be pushing the envelope a bit, uh, a bit too much. You know, historians don't like to deal with uh, hypothetical questions. Mm. But I wonder what Rosen and Robinson, how they would react to the case that that was being brought now to uh, against Israel at the at the ICJ for for genocide for the uh, uh, Gaza war that started in, in October twenty twenty three. I think it's more difficult for me to answer when it comes to Robinson. I mean, there was no question about the absolute dedication uh, to the cause. Uh, They were converts, and as converts, they were 
all in, right? Con- converts to Zionism. To Zionism, yeah, yeah. Uh, in different ways, of course, sure. to the different degrees and more measures, but uh, they, they were all in. I think they both, without a doubt, would uh, become part uh, of the team or would advise or would offer their advice or would whatever it was. At the same time, we do have an example. Uh, oh, we do have a concrete uh, piece of evidence uh, with Roseanne, who in the early 90s uh, did uh, represent, uh, elect to represent at a very early stage of the procedure before uh, in the International Court of Justice, uh, Serbia, mm. at the very preliminary stage. And if we read what he said, and we have the record of certain meetings uh, before the International Court of Justice, uh, certain proceedings, uh, certain what, what pleadings. What was his role in the... Uh... Uh, so, so he was representing Serbia. He was advising... Oh, on behalf of the Serbian government. Yes. Mm-hmm. He was a private individual. Yeah, right? sure. But he was hired yeah. by the Serbian yeah, government. As a right. lawyer. As a lawyer. Uh, and he... Um, I don't remember the precise words, of mm-hmm. course, but the bottom line of what he said is like... Don't talk to me about genocide, this is not genocide, this is, we know what genocide looks like. Mm, yeah, sounds eerily familiar. Ooh, yeah. We traced all sorts yeah. of eyebrows uh, in Israel and outside Israel, and I think that uh, he took the hint from all sorts of people who talked to him, and, and he left uh, mm. the team, or he stopped representing yeah, Syria after the, Serbia after the preliminary stage. Right. But... It might provide us a clue with some of the arguments or some of the thinking, at least, that he would bring to such, to contemporary proceedings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's really fascinating. Anyway, there's really so much more in in your book, um, uh, Jews, Sovereignty and International Law, Ideology and Ambivalence in Early Israeli Legal Diplomacy. Dr. Rotem Giladi, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Gilad. Pleasure. Thank you. And many thanks to Itai Shalem, the manager of TLV1 Studios, and to the Robinson Institute for their generous support. And now we've got a request, because many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. Good, bad, ugly, up to you. You too can support us by going to our website and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Check out our archive. It has probably close to a thousand interviews by now. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and most important, join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from us here in Tel Aviv, goodbye. Goodbye.